Okay, what'd you get? What'd you get? What'd you get? One, five, negative seven, negative two pipes, positive two pipes. Anyone? Pi? Pi. Positive pi. Well, let's see what we're doing here. We got sine of x. Sine is uh is sine sahala or chala? <laughs> it's sahala, right? So it's axis, pi, axis, but okay, so that's all we need. It looks like that. And uh, here's zero, and here's pi halves, right? So we're looking for the average rate of change, also known as the slope of the what line? Secant line, right. We want the slope of that secant line. It's the average rate of change from zero to pi halves. So we know it's going to be a positive number, yeah? So to find it, it's the uh, it's what? We, how do we find the slope of a secant line or the average rate of change? We use the, uh, Mr. Means, do you remember what it was? Or what, what fast food chain was it? It's not fast food, sorry. What fan food chain? Yeah, Dairy Queen. Yeah, it's Dairy Queen. So it's the difference quotient. So um, did we give our function a name? I did. I called it f of x. So uh, f of pi halves minus f of zero all over pi halves minus zero. So when we quiz next week, uh, that's what I would expect to see, the difference quotient. Even though we all know pi halves minus zero is uh, pi halves, right, I still want to see the minus zero. All right, so now we'll plug in. So this becomes sine of pi halves minus sine of zero all over. Now you could say it's just pi halves once you showed me the minus zero. All right, and guess, uh, let's see. You look at your watch and guess what time it is. It's 8.57, folks, which means it is unit circle time. So what is sine of pi halves? One. Yeah, good. And sine of zero is zero. So it's one over Pi halves, and then we could say change flip, and we get 2 over pi. So I threw that out there as a possible answer early, and no one said anything. Maybe you're just too shy. But that's it. That's the average rate of change. So on average, it goes up 2 over pi, up 2 over pi, or up 2 pi over 1, up 2 pi over 1. <clears throat> but that's not how it actually got there, right? Okay, cool. So we're good at finding average rates of changes. Uh, what if we wanted to know the instantaneous rate of change right here at pi halves? What would be the instantaneous rate of change at pi halves? Zero. Yeah. Now, normally we need two points for the slope of a line, but because this line is a very special line, what is it? It's horizontal. We can spot those very quickly. And so that actually is one of the other motivating uh, factors in, the, in, in, in what led to the discovery of calculus. How can we find maximum values or minimum values, right? Well, we can use calculus because in this case at a local maximum or over here at a local minimum, what do we know about the value of the derivative there? Apparently, it's what? Zero, right? Because remember the derivative, as we mentioned yesterday, is the instantaneous rate of change is the slope of the tangent line. So instead of finding the derivative function, which we're going to do here in a second, and plugging in a number to find the instantaneous rate of change, you can find the derivative function, set it equal to zero, and solve for x, and get the locations where you have these local maximums or local minimums. Very, very powerful tool. Okay, um, are you all warm? That's the theme from what? Twilight Zone, good. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's Twilight Zone Day. Twilight Zone was created by Rod Smith. Close. It starts with S, like beautiful death, beautiful day. It's really close. <clears throat> Rod Sterling. Rod Sterling. Not Sterling, like Sterling Silver. Rod Sterling. And it was a great show. It was a great show. It was all in black and white because um, they didn't have color back then. Or maybe they did have color and all the actors were just in black and white. I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, but, of course, the new Twilight Zone, the new Twilight Zone on Netflix is called Black Mirror. No, it's called Black Mirror. Yeah, it's Twilight Zone-ish, right? So has anyone ever watched Black Mirror? Good stuff. Yeah, good stuff, right? There's always that uh, twist at the end, and that's what was good about Twilight Zone. Okay, so anyway, it's Twilight Zone Day. Okay, so uh, let's get into the math zone here. We looked at this yesterday, the very important idea, right? We said that the derivative function, which we call f what? How do we read this? F, f prime of x, yeah. f prime of x is the derivative function. 
It's related to F. That's why we use the same letter, but it's not F. It gives us the slopes of the tangent line. It is the limit as H goes to zero of F of X plus H minus F of X over H. Now, if I just threw that at you and said memorize it, you'd be like, ooh, that's ugly. But we didn't do that, right? I actually developed it for you. The thing in the box is the difference quotient, right? It's the change in the two Y values over the change in X, which we just call H instead of delta X. And then that gives you the slope of the secant line. And the magic is letting H, which we define to be the distance between the two X values, if we let it approach zero, that forces the secant line to become the tangent line. It forces the average rate of change to become the instantaneous rate of change. So this is the definition or the limit definition of the derivative, and it works for any function f of x or h of x or g of x or whatever its name is. Okay? So sticking with example 7, if I wanted to find the slope of the tangent line at different points, I had this way that we did in example 5, but I would have to set up the difference quotient each and every time for a different value of x, like negative 3 or 2. So what we're going to do on example 7 now is we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to just let x represent a random x value. And we're going to treat it like a constant, and we're going to work it all the way through as if it were a constant. And at the end, on the back end, after we evaluate it, we're going to be like, ha-ha, trick your limit. It's actually a variable. We're going to let it be a variable again, okay? So let's try it out. It says given f of x equals x squared plus 1, the same function we've been working with, Find the derivative function f prime of x using the limit definition. All right, so here we go. This is important. This is like, uh, this, is, this is calculus. This is calculus right here. We're going to say f prime of x equals, and I'm going to go ahead and write out the limit definition. The limit as h goes to 0 of the function evaluated at x plus h minus the function evaluated at some random value x all over x plus h minus x, right? The change in the corresponding x values which should always end up being H. Keep in mind that H, remember, is just your delta X. And what we have here is just the delta Y over delta X, the difference quotient. We're just letting uh, delta X go to zero, in other words. All right, so that works for any function. So for our function, X squared plus 1, we're going to say F prime of X equals. We're going to keep the limit in front every time. It's the last thing we do, but we keep it fully intact, okay? So what is, uh, let's do the numerator. F of x plus h, that's going to be x plus h squared plus 1. And then minus f of x is just x squared plus 1. And then all over h. So this is my favorite problem. And you all did this earlier in the year, but you didn't call it f prime of x, and you didn't have the limit in front. You were just evaluating that quotient, the difference quotient. Okay? So again, setting up the numerator is super important. And because it's always a minus in the top, that second thing in the brackets needs to either have brackets or parentheses. Okay, so once we get to the setup, now it's just a matter of evaluating. Again, we keep writing the limit, uh, and then we square multiply double square. We get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus 1, and then we distribute and get minus x squared minus 1. So that should have that old familiar feel. We did that a lot. All right, so working straight down, keeping the limit there. Uh, if you set it up right and you expanded it correctly, same thing. Good things should happen. In the top, everything that doesn't have an H should cancel. So make sure that it does. If it actually doubles instead of cancels, you didn't set it up right or you distributed incorrectly by not distributing. So we have two terms left in the top, and notice they both have an H. So if I factor that out, we're left with 2X plus H all over this H. And then, remember, H can't be zero because then we have one point. But now we have h over h, so we know there's a hole there, so we can divide out those h's, and once the bad guys that are causing zero in the denominator and the top are gone, the world is once again safe for democracy, direct substitution, I mean, okay, once the bad guys are gone. Actually, just other bad guys popped up in their place, right? <clears throat> we got rid of Saddam, and then we got rid of Osama, and then we got rid of Gaddafi, and then ISIS sprang up, right? But you don't hear about ISIS very much anymore. So that's good. And I didn't even remember that guy's name. What do we do now once the bad guys are gone? What did we do? What did we do yesterday? This 2x plus h, again, gives you the uh, slope of the secant line between any two points on that graph at x and another point h units away. So if we wanted to find secant lines now between any two points, 
like 5 and 7, we would let x equal 5 and we let h equal how far away are 5 and 7? 2, right? So that's what h is. It's the distance between them. So the slope of the secant line between 5 and 7 would be x equals 5 and h equals 2. If we wanted to find the slope of the secant line between negative 3 and 4, x would equal negative 3 and h would equal 7. Good, you're getting it. But we don't want secant lines, do we? We want tangent lines. So if we let h go to 0, 2x plus h approaches, you're essentially plugging a 0 in for any h that remains, and you're left with 2 times x. 2 times x. Now, you remember yesterday Galileo was grumbling a lot? He's, he's digging his way out of the grave right now. I mean, he's not just turning over. He is, he is clawing his way out. He's trying to get to this because this is the derivative. We let x, we treated x as a constant all the way through, but now on the back end, since the h is gone, it's in terms of x again. And so this is the holy grail of this process. This gives you a variable function now as a function of x, which allows you to find the slope of the tangent line, the instantaneous rate of change, at a single point, at a single value of x, without needing another point, okay? That's awesome. So, like, let's come up here and find f prime of negative 3. We worked on that so diligently, remember, way up here on example 4, we chose negative 3 and some other point, and we looked to see what the sequence of the slopes were as that other point got closer. Uh, 2, negative 1, negative 3, negative 5. It was getting closer to negative 6. Okay, we can maybe infer that. And then we came down here on example 5, and we actually set it up with negative 3, and we got h minus 6, which when h went to 0, we actually got negative 6. But now, since I've done it with an x, I've done all the work one time, and now I've got my distilled product here. If I wanted to know what the slope of the graph of f was at negative 3, I just plug in a negative 3 into f prime. So I get f prime and negative 3 is, I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. I won't get it. God, that was a buzzkill right there. We were on the verge of negative six. Negative six. It's a negative six. Yeah. Like, it's, just two, it's, just, it's just two times negative three. It's negative six. Okay, cool. And then remember, we did it for two. We also did it at x equals two, right? And we set it up, and we did all the work all over again, and we got h plus four. And then as h went to 0, we plugged in a 0, and we got 4. Well, guess what? Now it says, oh, you want the slope at 2? That's just f prime at 2. Okay, that's just 2 times 2, which is what? Holy moly smokers. That was easy. We didn't have to set it up and reevaluate it, right? We're just plugging in. It turns out you just double the x value in this case to get the slope at that point. Sweet. Now, if you wanted to know, here's the power of calculus in reverse. If you wanted to know where f of x equals x squared plus 1, that's a parabola. You're like, hmm, I wonder what the x-coordinate of the vertex is. Hmm, because I don't remember what the graph looks like. I don't know how to do transformations. I wonder what the x-coordinate of the vertex is. What do we know about the vertex, the derivative at the vertex? It should be what? Zero. So here's the power of calculus. Let's set f prime of x equal to zero. That would be 2x equals zero. And now all we have to do is solve for x. Divide through by 2, and you get x equals zero. Wow. So that is the x-coordinate of the vertex of the parabola, because that's where the slope is zero. That's a very powerful application. If you take calculus, we'll be doing that a lot, taking derivatives, setting them equal to zero, so that we can find x values where we have horizontal tangents. Here's the vocab word right here. That's called a critical value. A critical value is a value of x where the derivative is zero and later on undefined. But right now, that's just critical value is where the derivative is equal to zero. A critical value is a possible location of a local max and a local min, and therefore a possible location of an absolute max or an absolute min. Pretty cool stuff. Um, are you impressed? You should be, because that's calculus. We, we, we now have a way to find, we now have a way to find, um, cool, yeah, I'm in tears. Okay, so, um, let's, uh, let's, 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 let's do this. Um, someone give me your position function, kinematic position function from physics. Does anyone remember it? Did you call it X of T, Y of T, or S of T? Let's call it, uh, let's, let's say we're moving, uh, let's call it H of T. How about that? 
because usually it's for falling objects. So H of T is, what was it? You memorize it because you're good students. Your kinematic, you don't have to memorize the formula chart? Oh, man. In calculus, guess what? We don't insult you by giving you a formula chart because we know you can memorize it. You get no formula chart in calculus. You just memorize everything. Uh, how about negative one-half little g t squared plus, did you call it v sub o or v sub i? Your initial velocity. V sub o, that, that means velocity at zero. Some people say v sub i, which is initial velocity t, plus h sub o, your initial height. Does that look about right? Does that look about right? That looks about right. Now, if you didn't have the negative in front, it's because you assigned a negative value to little g. If you have the negative in front, you're assigning a positive value to g. Did you all have a negative in front or not? you remember? It depends on how you're defining little g. Little g is either uh, negative 9.8 meters per second squared or positive 9.8 meters per second squared or 32 feet per second squared or negative 32 feet per second squared. I'll just work it with this. Okay, let's go ahead and find the derivative of that, shall we? What do we call the instantaneous rate of change of position? Wow, look at his position change. He is fast. It's called velocity. So h prime of t is the velocity. All right. Let's go ahead and find it using the limit definition. This will be fun. Ready? So it's going to be the limit now as h goes to 0 of h of t plus, oh, h is a bad choice, right? Because we're using h for, oh, well. Let's just call H delta X like the old school people did. Remember, H is delta X. We'll just use delta X here. Okay? It's just a small distance. So H of T plus delta X minus H of T. So that's the change in the two Y values over delta X, the change in the corresponding X value. It was, H is a recent adaptation. People used to have to work with the compound variable delta X. So, All right, here we go. So... Uh, to set up the numerator, and I have h going to 0. I should have delta x going to 0. Okay, there we go. So how do we, how do we determine what h of t plus delta x is? Well, we plug it in for t. So brackets, we're going to have negative 1 half g times t plus delta x quantity squared plus v sub o times t plus delta x plus h sub o. So all I did is I plugged in for t up above in my position equation, t plus delta x, and I need, to, I need to scoot all this over. Okay. And then minus negative one-half g t squared plus v sub o t plus h sub o, all over delta x. I also need to scoot it up. Okay, sweet. So, ah! <laughs> Yeah, all that work. It's gone. All right? Can you imagine if, like, Newton was on the verge of discovering it and then his, like, iPad went dead and he lost it all? Oh, it didn't save. Oh, well. I'll just go back to spinning yarn into gold. <sighs> okay, so here we go. We got the limit as delta x goes to zero of, and now we carefully expand this out, right? So we're going to have a – that's an ugly bracket. Here we go. I'm not going to try and distribute everything, so it's just a negative one-half g, and now we square multiply double square. So t squared plus 2t delta x plus delta x squared. That's how we write that. And if we distribute here, we get v sub o t plus v sub o delta x plus h sub o. Okay? And then if we distribute the negative, we get plus one-half little g t squared minus v sub o t minus h sub o all over delta x. Now, what we have right here is the making of some chalkboard graffiti in a Hollywood movie, right? If you've ever seen that, you walk into this and someone has this on the board behind them, and it's like, ooh, they're smart, right? I always pause the movie right there, and I actually look at the board, and I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. Those things aren't even related, right? It's just mass graffiti. Someone just Googled mass graffiti, and then they, like, copied onto the board, right? So it's kind of funny. Have you ever done that? You look to see if they're actually working a problem that makes sense. Typically, things are written on their sideways or over here. It's, it's not real math. Okay. But notice all the symbols. It looks pretty complicated. 
All right, so let's keep going, right, because we're not done, and that's what we do when we're not done. We keep going. We persist. We now need to distribute all of that. So we're going to get negative one-half little g t squared. The 2 and the 1 half divide out. Nice. So we get negative g t delta x uh, minus 1 half g delta x squared. Sweet. And then plus v sub o t plus v sub o delta x plus h sub o. That looks amazing. Plus 1 half g t squared minus v sub o t minus h sub o. All over delta x. All right. So... Sweet. All right, so now if, if we've been doing this right, if we've been doing this right, good things should happen. What happens with your negative one-half GT squared? They cancel out. Good. So I'm just going to highlight them. Um, what about your V sub OTs? You have plus V sub OT minus V sub OT. And what about your H sub O's? There's an H sub O and a minus H sub O. So you look at all the terms that don't have a delta X in them, and you're like, please cancel, please cancel, please cancel. And they do. And you're like, yes. All right. So the three terms that are left have a delta X in it, so I will factor it out. And that leaves me with negative GT minus one-half G. We're still left with one delta X there plus V sub O all over delta X. Now, delta x can't equal zero, because if delta x is zero, we only have one point, and we need two points. So what happens with your delta x's now? They divide out. And we know that to evaluate the limit, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to work straight down here. To evaluate the limit now, all we have to do is plug in a zero for any delta x that remains, and we end up with negative gt plus v sub o. And that should be the instantaneous velocity that should be the instantaneous velocity. As you memorize it, you either memorize it as negative gt plus v sub o or gt plus v sub o. Okay, where v sub o is your initial velocity. So that's where the kinematic equation came from. So that's why they probably give you a formula chart, right? So you don't have to do all that to get from here to here. For your instantaneous velocity for a falling object? Oh, 2 delta H. Oh, um, yeah, that, 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 but that does not, that's the wrong formula. That, that, because uh, that's delta H, that's over an interval. This is the instantaneous thing. Like if you have a book falling at a certain rate and you want to know at T equals one second, how fast is it falling at that moment? That's it. That's the equation you would use. Yeah. Now, we could actually take the derivative of this without using calculus because this is a linear function, right? It's T to the first. So it turns out that the derivative of velocity, the instantaneous rate of change of velocity, is acceleration. And because the velocity function is a linear function, it has a constant slope. And what's the slope of the line? What's the coefficient of the variable? This is mx plus b, so the slope is negative g. And that's true, right? Because the acceleration is now the gravitational constant. It's the gravitational constant, negative g, or little g, depending if you define it to be positive or negative. All right, so acceleration due to gravity is a constant. Now, guess how the kinematic equations came into existence? They didn't come into existence in this direction. They actually came into existence in this direction. People observed the gravitational constant. That's an observable empirical quantity. Okay, and once you have that, you actually take the derivative in reverse to get the instantaneous velocity, and then you take the derivative in reverse to get the position equation. And that's the magic of calculus. So it's easier to learn going forward, but really going backwards is what drives calculus and where all these formulas came from, right? That's, that's pretty fantastic. All those formulas on that formula chart that y'all have, that y'all didn't memorize, which is fine because you have the chart, those, all, those are all derived from calculus because in physics, everything changes and usually at a variable rate, usually at a variable rate, okay? But y'all are taking non-calculus-based physics. There is a calculus-based physics where you don't have to use a formula chart. You just use calculus to get what you need, okay? 
So pretty cool, pretty cool. All right, let's look at example eight, and we'll call it a day. What happens to the derivative function and or the specific slopes calculated above if the original function, x squared plus 1, was shifted vertically? Well, let's see what that is. Uh, let's graph x squared plus 1 again. There is 1. And look at this guy. He's perpetually smiling, right? If I were to take that, let's draw some tangent lines on there. Let's draw a tangent line at 2 because that's one of the ones we did. Here's the tangent line at negative 3. And then here's the tangent line at zero. That snap feature is really nice. Okay. So what would happen to the slopes at those points or the slopes of those tangent lines if I were to take this graph and move it up or down? They would be exactly the same, right? Because those lines, the tangent lines would be what allele? Parallel. Good, good. And parallel lines have the exact same slope. So it doesn't really matter where the function is. Horizontal shifts are going to mess it up. Because horizontal shifts change the, the horizontal location of things. But when you shift the graph up or down, um, a vertical shift does not change the value of the slopes at that point because the lines are parallel. Okay? So that's pretty cool. So let's go ahead and say uh, vertical shifts. do not change the values of a derivative. Now let's see why. Let's see why. If I had f of x equals uh, 4, what would be the derivative of that? Do we need to use calculus for that? What would the graph of y equals 4 look like? It would look like this, right? If the derivative is the slope function at any point, and if y equals 4 is a horizontal line, what is the slope at every point? Zero. So guess what the derivative of a constant is? Zero. You don't need any fancy formula for that. So if I shift the graph vertically, let's go ahead and shift the graph of 4 up 1 by adding 1 to it. Ooh, what did that do? That moved it up 1. See, did you see it move up 1? Okay, cool. Now it's up here at 5. What's the derivative of that function? Still zero. Okay. So vertical shifts, because you're just adding a constant, do not change the value of the derivative, because it's just a horizontal line, and a horizontal line always has a slope of zero. So the derivative of a constant is zero. What's the derivative of a linear function of the form mx plus b? What would be f prime of x for that? Do we need to set up that limit definition and evaluate it? We could, but we don't need to. Because remember, the slopes of a line are boring. They're the same everywhere, and it would always be what? M. And, of course, then B would go to zero. So you only really need to use the derivative limit definition on things that are not constants or not linear. All right? Um, so let's, let's summarize with this another important idea, and we'll call it a week, right? Two functions, f of x and g of x, differ by only a constant. That means they're shifted vertically of each other. Um, that is, if f of x equals g of x plus c, if and only if, if and only if, oh, Maryland is calling again. Gosh dang it, Maryland. I forgot where I was. Two functions differ only by a constant, a vertical shift, if and only if their derivatives are the what? Same, equal, right? If and only if their derivative is equal. You could do that in the, other, in the other direction. If two functions have the same derivative, do they have to be the same function? If two functions have the same derivative, that is, if two functions have the exact same slopes at the exact same x values for all x values, do they have to be the same function? No. But if they're not the same function, they only differ by a what? You're not going to make me do this, right? Until I fly away. I only got one wing. All right. Um, they only differ by a constant. They're just vertical shifts of each other. That made me dizzy. Wow. Okay. We're going to stop right there. Um, happy Twilight Zone Day. <laughs>